You know, the first character I ever played in D&D 5e was a cleric monk multiclass. He was a dragonborn who had survived the truly horrifying slaughter of his people at a young age and been found by a journeying monk soon after, who adopted him and took him back to his monastery to give him a new home. My monk, named Anir, would later leave on a personal journey, and during that journey he sought to reconnect with his people's culture by beginning to worship Tiamat and Bahamut together. As his people had believed that both gods together were responsible for the Dragonborn race, and that they represented the very real potential for both phenomenal good and terrible evil that sleeps within us all. It was interesting being the cleric of two gods, and I found that I could use Aenea to explore my own relationship to religion and the idea of faith. I really enjoyed playing him, and I wish I could have wrapped up his character arc before the campaign disbanded for external reasons, but I'll always hold on to the memories of my very first and favourite character. There are a lot of reasons why someone might play D&D. Maybe it's just for fun, maybe it's for the purpose of entertaining others. Some people play it as their job, and some people might only play it because it's a way to spend more time with friends. But no matter your reasons, the universal truth is that you're going to have to pick a class to play, and that can be a hard decision for some people. There are 13 classes to choose from, uh, 13 if you count the Bloodhunter, and indecision is an eternal curse that plagues us all. And that's before you even consider race and subclass, and honestly, the whole process can be a mess. I mean, what even makes one class appeal over another? Why choose a wizard over an artificer, or a ranger instead of a fighter? Why play a rogue when you could play a monk or a sorcerer? Well. I can't help you make that decision, but I think I can help you understand why you might want to try a class out, and that's exactly what I'll try to do. In this new series of videos with no working title as of yet, though I'm open to suggestions, I'll be working to explain each of the different classes and what makes them great. And because I can't do anything by halves, I'll also be throwing in a homebrew subclass for each video. So if you just want to get to that part, head to the timestamp on screen. Also, stick around at the end for an important announcement. For everyone else, let's get started, shall we? So if you somehow manage to click on the video without reading the title, this video will be all about the cleric, and I plan to tackle it on two fronts, mechanical and narrative. Because let's be honest, you'll never want to play a class for just one of these reasons. What makes the class work is just as important as what makes your character work, but there's a degree of exclusivity to the reasons. As such, we'll begin with the mechanical explanation for no other reason than that's the order I want to go in. Also the speed paint and art in this video uh, were done by my friend K Space Print Art. I'll link to their Tumblr down below, you should definitely give them a look. Part 1. Pray, slay, maybe heal if you have time in the day. The Cleric is a surprisingly versatile class, thanks to having the actually highest number of official subclasses at 13, beating out the wizards by 1. Known as Divine Domains, Clerics are one of the few to choose their subclass at level 1, a trait shared only by the Warlock and Sorcerer classes, which makes sense. Your power has to come from somewhere, and there isn't really an equivalent to elective credits in the church. However, the Divine Domain doesn't just determine which kind of god you'll be worshipping, but also what variety of extra spells and abilities you'll be starting with. Clerics are fairly unique in that they gain domain spells, which are spells themed around your god of choice that are always prepared for free, something that no other class would get until more recent sorcerer subclasses. This actually serves as a boon from a both mechanical and role-playing standpoint, as it both helps give people an idea of what your character is about, and it expands the cleric spell list which can feel somewhat limited when compared to the arcane and primal spell lists. That's not to say that clerics don't have great spells, they actually have some of the best in the game, but I'll get to that later. Your cleric domain is the first thing you'll choose for your character, and like I said, there are a good deal to select from. All clerics start with proficiency in light and medium armour as well as shields, making them one of the better defending classes, and depending on your chosen domain, you may also gain proficiency in heavy armour and martial weapons, meaning it's entirely viable to roll up an immovable tank with a battle wearing and halberd, who also just happens to be able to kiss the boo-boos goodbye with the same ease by which they inflict them. If you're looking to make yourself an armoured battle saint, then the Life, Forge, Tempest, Twilight, Order, Nature and War domains might appeal the most. Life will appeal the most if you want to make the most cleric-y cleric to ever pray and slay, as they come equipped with a boost to your healing magic and some of the best options from the cleric spell list set for your domain spells, meaning you don't have to worry about paying the revivify tax. Or maybe you want to be more of a blaster, in which case the Tempest Domain might be right for you, which comes with plenty of thunder and lightning, plus the ability to max out the damage of your thunderbolts. Then again, maybe you want more versatility and support capability out of your tank, in which case the Twilight Domain has you covered, with not only some amazingly useful domain spells, 
but also some of the best level 1 features out of any subclass ever. It's actually pretty incredible just how helpful a Twilight Cleric can be. Additionally, each of these subclasses gains access to the Divine Strike feature, which deals an additional D8 and later 2D8 extra damage on your weapon strikes. If you want to feel like more of a magical powerhouse though, then the Arcana, Death, Grave, yes they are two different things, Light, Knowledge and Peace domains might be more your style. Though they lack heavy armor and martial weapons, except death, they get martial weapons for some reason, possibly because people want scythes, they more than make up for it with versatile magic and a wider suite of abilities, such as the light domain, which can cast fireball and blind people to avoid attacks, or the grave domain, which gains the ability to max out the healing doled out to downed allies, along with the ability to basically sentence anybody to death. Oh, and the power to cancel critical hits. And then there's the arcana domain, which not only has a variety of wizardly domain spells and the ability to banish creatures without the use of a spell slot, but also eventually gets to pick a 6th, 7th, 8th and 9th level spell from the wizard spell list to just have as domain spells. You can play a cleric that can cast Disintegrate or fucking Wish, it just gets to do that. All of the clerics in this grouping also gain the potent spellcasting feature which adds your wisdom modifier to the damage of your cantrips, which can add up very quickly and give your cleric a body count to rival the barbarian. So yeah, the domains are pretty neat. I'll link to a page on them in the description, so have fun building your Agent of Divine Wrath. As I mentioned before, the cleric spell list has some of the best spells in the game. Not only does it have the easiest access to radiant and necrotic damage in the Sacred Flame and Tall the Dead cantrips, but it also contains the most healing magic of any class spell list, as well as some of the greatest low level spells, such as Inflict Wounds, the potentially strongest single target spell in the game, or Guiding Bolt, which does big damage and grants advantage in the next attack against the target, or a spiritual weapon, which is a bonus action to cast and use and lasts a minute and doesn't require concentration. Or you could cast Divination or Commune, the only spells powerful enough to force the DM to answer a question honestly. That's right, clerics are the only class with the ability to get an answer on the most important question of them all. Just... Why? God. Aside from their spell list, Clerics are set apart from the other classes by two more features, Channel Divinity and Divine Intervention. Channel Divinity allows you to apply your god's influence more directly than simple spellcasting, and it changes depending on the domain. For example, the Grove domain has Path to the Grave, which makes a target vulnerable to the damage of the next attack they take. With some creative teamwork, you can actually use this to completely destroy an enemy in a single turn. The Trickery domain, which I didn't mention earlier but is really fun, has Invoke Duplicity, which creates an illusory duplicate so convincing it can actually give you flanking bonuses with yourself, and you can cast spells from its place. Then there's the Guided Strike of the Wire domain, which is just a temporary aimbot for you or your allies, never miss again. Or the truly ridiculous Twilight Sanctuary of the Take a Wild Fucking Guess domain, which, as a free action, lets you grant temporary HP to any creature that ends the turn within 30 feet of you, or lets you end the charm and frightened effects on them. Again, for fucking free. And later it even gets an upgrade that also grants half cover. <laughs> the Twilight Domain is fucking amazing, not gonna lie. All clerics also have a generic channel divinity called Turn Undead, which sadly doesn't allow you to temporarily become a zombie as you can gain their trust and backstab them when the right moment arrives, and instead simply makes them run as far away from you as they can if they fail a wisdom saving throw. This is later upgraded to Destroy Undead, which just completely obliterates lower challenge rating undead creatures, which is specifically why there could never be a zombie apocalypse in the world of 5e. Just get one church of level 5 clerics and you can essentially undo the entire army in a few hours, given enough short rests. Finally, there's Divine Intervention. So, starting at level 10, you gain the ability to pray extra hard and potentially have Sky, Mommy or Daddy or Guardian, because I can't think of a good gender neutral word that ends with Y, come down and fix a problem for you. All you have to do is roll a d100 and if the result is equal to or lower than your cleric level, you get to sit back and watch the divine fireworks. Potentially. Obviously the chances of success are phenomenally low, but the actual results are also entirely up to your dungeon master, as they're the only god you should actually be praying to when you play the game. Depending on your DM, pulling this off might be the most amazing part of your session, or it could be the biggest letdown of the campaign. Allow me to be completely frank for a moment. If you're a DM, I strongly encourage you to allow successful divine interventions to feel as big as they are. The odds are already low and rewarding the player for a successful gamble will help them feel like they truly have an impact on the story, which is worth far more in the long run than whatever encounter or intended solution you had planned. And players, remember to word your divine ask 
as specifically as possible, not just to avoid having it willfully misinterpreted, but because doing so will make it easier on your DM, who definitely didn't expect this to work any more than you did. D&D is a communal experience, and it's going to be at its most fun and successful when you work together on things like this. If you should be lucky enough to find someone willing to DM you to level 20, the Claire Capstone ability is the perfect divine intervention, which automatically succeeds without the need for a roll. Just keep in mind that, once you succeed, you can't use it again for an in-game week, so make sure you use it when it counts. I'd also like to advise any new cleric players thusly. Do not play your cleric like you would a healer in another game. While healing is vastly important in D&D, you don't have limitless resources with which to do so. If you try to play your cleric like, say, a support unit in Overwatch, you're going to find yourself massively ill-equipped for anything more challenging than a single battle a day. Try to save your healing only for when it's absolutely necessary and focus on damage and support spells like Bless or Bane, Blindness Deafness, Shield of Faith, Hold Person and Spirit Guardians. As proper use of these spells can and will make an even greater difference into a battle than the thoughtless use of healing magic. Remember, preventative measures are the backbone of any support class. So yeah, that's the basics of the cleric mechanics. And now, we move on. Part 2. Finding the Divine Spark I think the most interesting thing about playing a cleric is that it allows you to explore the idea of faith as a story element. I know that, traditionally speaking, clerics need to follow a god, but you shouldn't consider it to be the only real option you have. Faith itself is a power source in the world of Dungeons and & Dragons, and the gods require faith to maintain their divinity in the same way that we need food or water to survive. Not all gods, mind you. There are exceptions, like the Overgods or the Lady of Pain, though she's technically something of an anti-god considering she spurned the idea of being worshipped altogether. Um, but faith itself is an empowering force, and there's nothing that says your cleric needs to specifically worship a deity. Similar to how a paladin's power comes from their oath itself and not any sworn god, it's entirely possible to create a cleric whose faith is in a concept or in a specific individual, and that's what grants them the power. I think the most famous example of the latter is Jess Lavar from Critical Role, who, spoiler warning, was led to believe that the Archfey Artagon was a god, and her belief in him raised him into something greater than he was before. Her faith in him was so strong that it created a spark of divinity that allowed him to empower her in exchange. It all stemmed from the impression he left upon her as a child. Pure belief like that is powerful, and in D&D, you can always find a way to explore the idea of faith in new and interesting ways. Imagine someone who believes, not in a god, but in the innate worth and beauty of human kindness, so much so that it inspires in them the desire to protect it, and through that belief and desire, they find that they can heal the wounded and guard against malevolent influences. Imagine playing a guardian of kindness and peace, he travels to help those in need and fight against the cruelty of tyrants. Or could you imagine a character who was raised by their grandmother, living out in the woods on their own and being taught that nature would always provide for them, so long as it was protected in turn? Normally this might inspire a druidic character, but that sort of faith in the forest could lead to a more atypical nature cleric, one who isn't familiar with the gods of nature, but one whose personal connection to the natural world grants them that inherent holiness. The possibilities are endless. You could even make a cleric who technically qualifies as an atheist, not someone who doesn't believe the gods exist because their existence is a well-recorded and proven fact, but someone who doesn't believe the gods are divine, if that makes sense. But I just want to impress upon you that your character can really believe in anything. Faith can literally make gods in D&D, so don't feel shackled to any existing paradigm. I've personally used my cleric characters to explore my own relationship to faith and religion. I'm not religious, nor did I have a religious upbringing, but mainly due to my gender and sexuality, religion has had its own impact upon my life outside my beliefs, and I've enjoyed reflecting on my feelings through my characters. Remember, your characters are a part of you. You are a god creating souls of your own through a silly little role-playing game, and what they do and experience is likely going to leave a powerful impact upon you when all is said and done. Let yourself fall into the character, embrace their journey as your own. That's the beauty of the game, I think. It's a story that you have a hand in writing, and that you will help shape through your own actions, and I think there's something just a little bit holy in that. Part 3. The Origin Cleric I want to wrap this video up by introducing my homebrew cleric subclass, the Origin Cleric. I was actually inspired to create it when I was running my very first campaign, which featured the Protogenoi. 
the primordial gods of the Greek pantheon, and the very first to be born from chaos, the Greek progenitor god. And when one of my players decided they want to multi-class into a cleric for Physis, the original god of nature itself, I ended up deciding that it needed its own subclass. Urgent clerics aren't part of a greater order, nor are they normally recognised by the wider religious world. An origin cleric is instead handpicked to act as the avatar for a primeval god. These gods tend to fit the role of progenitor, but they aren't over gods such as Io. They are, however, supremely ancient and powerful, to the point where they don't require worship, as they're rather above all but the most extreme issues that plague the world. When one is spared to act, however, you can be sure it's a matter of dire consequences. Gods such as Adolma, Quetzalcoatl or Physis are possible examples, but you can really fit any primeval god into the role. I wanted to really emphasise the theme of primordial power in the subclass, which is why the first subclass feature is called Ancient Knowledge, which grants proficiency in your choice of arcana, history or nature, and also gives you two free cantrips from any spell list of your choice. At second level, you gained your channel divinity, Overwhelming Aether, which allows you to choose one foe and, until the end of your next turn, reduce their armor class and penalize their saving throws by three as your gods might temporarily weather their defenses. I think it'll allow for some interesting strategies, especially against more powerful enemies. At level six, you gain a second use of your channel divinity, Cronus' Sight, which puts you in a trance and allows you to discover any information from the past of an object, creature, or area, so long as it isn't protected from divination magic. This takes the form of a memory you can recall at any time, and sort of acts as a cross between the scrying and legend lore spell. You are completely vulnerable when using this feature, but I feel like it's an acceptable trade-off. This feature should be a boon to both players and dungeon masters, not just from a role-playing perspective, but because I've never met a single DM who doesn't want to just gush about the history of their world, and this will kind of let them. At level 8, you get potent spellcasting, which gives your cantrips an extra kick. Finally, level 17 gives you Grand Aether, which buffs your first channel divinity so that it now lasts one minute and the penalty is bumped up to five, which I feel is perfectly acceptable at this level, considering the truly ridiculous saves most enemies have at this point. There's also a small health regen effect, because this is a Fire Emblem reference, so sue me. For the Origin Domain spells, I wanted to really give the feeling of wielding magic from a stronger, older source, which I think is mostly expressed well through the list in question. Oh, and Ars Magia. What's that? Well, it's a new spell. That's right, you've fallen for one of the classic blunders. I didn't just make one homebrew option for you guys, I made two. You blind fools, you ignorant buffoons. <laughs> okay, I'll stop now. Ars Magia is, in all honesty, not super complicated, as it mostly acts as an upgrade to counter spell absorbing and reflecting instead of merely negating. It would most reasonably belong on the wizard and sorcerer spell lists, but I like the idea that the origin cleric would be given the tools to handle other schools of magic, since clerics tend to suffer from a lack of reaction spells and the means to compete with the sheer breadth of the arcane spell list. This would, at the very least, allow you to feel more versatile and prepared. So yeah, that's the origin cleric. Uh, please let me know your thoughts on it in the comments, and if you do end up using it at all, uh, please come back and comment your experience. I'd love to hear if it worked out for you. Again, special thanks to K Space Prince Art for the gorgeous cleric artwork they made for me, and to my good friend Lustrous Lizard for helping me put the subclass into this lovely and official looking PDF form. I'll link to both their socials down below, and I'll put the pages for the subclass and spell up on my Twitter and Tumblr, which you can also find in the description. I hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, thanks for watching. Oh right, the announcement. A uh, quick question for you viewer, do you like D&D? You probably do if you're watching this video. And do you like me? I hope so, I really try to be likeable. Well, if that's a yes to both accounts, then you should check out Remico's Dungeons and Eventually Dragons, a Twitch channel where my good friend and dungeon master Remico streams his 5e campaigns. We'll be starting a brand new campaign on June 9th at 1pm. The time zone is GMT-5. Don't tell the other players, but I'll be playing an atheist arcana cleric that lived in an extra-dimensional library run by an ancient amethyst dragon. Their name is Rowan Danis, and they'll be on the search for a means to break the curse that's befallen them, armed only with an insatiable curiosity about the world and a never-ending supply of trail mix for the road. If that sounds like a fun time, then please come join us for the start of our new adventure. We'll be streaming every other Sunday and I hope to see you guys there. Okay, now the video is done.